Joel, it's such a great pleasure to be speaking with you today about your new book, um, The Foundation, A Great American Secret, How Private Wealth is Changing the World. Great title, by the way, and I think it's, it's quite true. Uh, we're at a pivotal turning point, it seems to me, in the history of foundations. Foundations are much more visible, I think, than they have been in the past. We have uh, constant news stories about the Gates Foundation and the things that they're doing in Africa. We have the Warren Buffett's magnificent gift to the Gates Foundation, $31 billion. And yet, despite all that publicity, your book says, and I think it's true, that this foundations are a great American secret. And that secret, it seems to me, is double-edged. Um, the public doesn't know about foundations, and foundations are quite secretive. Tell us about this great American secret. The reason I wrote the book uh, is that uh, I believe the public deserves to know what foundations do, and that foundations deserve to have the public know what they do. Um, given the fact that foundations are messing around in every, lots of things dealing with the public, public supported programs, um, public education, welfare, the environment, uh, health, all of those things, uh, the public has a right to know what foundations are doing. Um, but more than that, uh, if the public doesn't know exactly what foundations are doing, those people who want to start programs of their own really don't have any basis on which to make a judgment about what works, what doesn't work, how it works, why it doesn't work. Um, and that really is the nature of the secret. The, the secret, I, I call it a secret for two reasons. One, because foundations really don't tell very much about what they're doing. And secondly, uh, because of the fact that um, the public doesn't know anything about foundations. The surveys show that if you ask the public um, what, what a foundation is, uh, the most recent survey I, showed, uh, I saw uh, uh, revealed that only 12% of the public knew what a foundation, could name a foundation. That's just naming a foundation. That doesn't have anything to do with naming what the foundation does. And so, so what should the public know, Joe? I think the public really should know when, about foundation failures, for example. Um, it's, you know, it's inconceivable, impossible, that, if, that with the 30-some billion dollars that a foundation sp spends every year, that the, all the foundations spend every year, that mm -hmm. uh, they, don't make any, they don't have any failures. And yet, for the, when I wrote the book, I could document only four or five um, publicly acknowledged failures by foundations. Now, that's just unbelievable. What that means is that not only are our foundations not talking about their failures, but why should people believe what they say about their successes uh, if they don't talk about their failures? Because people are going to say, well, if they don't talk about their failures, there must be some things wrong there, and some of these things they're claiming as successes really weren't successes. Now, do you think people understand, Joel, you know, what is a foundation? Maybe we ought to start there. Uh, why, why are they important in the American polyarchy, a ter term that you use? They're very important because they empower individuals with widely varying points of view to express their values in ways that affect the larger sphere. So that you've got lots of different ways of solving the problem of public, problems of public education if you've got many different people working in there. And what I say in the book is that, that you, given the fact that America has um, uh, a nonprofit sector which is, most people would say who think about this thing, the envy of the world. Mm -hmm. We've got, at this point, um, uh, according to the most recent count, more than a million uh, 501c3 charitable nonprofits. That doesn't include most of the churches and religious organizations, which probably is another 300 to 350,000 entities. So you're up to 1.3 million charitable organizations plus the non-charitable not-for-profit organizations, that is the, the, the PACs and a variety of other uh, mutual benefit organizations. Mm -hmm. So you, you've got a nonprofit sector with 1.9 million organizations spending, according to the IRS's most recent figures, somewhere in excess of a trillion dollars. It's probably close to a 1.5 trillion dollars, 1.4 trillion dollars. You put mm -hmm. that against the federal, the federal budget, for example, which you've got a federal budget uh, this year of $2.8 trillion in a national economy of $14 trillion. You think about that's a very significant proportion of what the federal government is spending. So 
it's important that the public understand that the, that the nonprofit sector is important. The nonprofit sector, the venture capital that enables the nonprofit sector to be creative, original, pioneering in its solutions, is in large part the work of foundations. The foundations really are the kernel of that social venture capital that powers the nonprofit sector. And I think it's extremely important that, um, that we have as many different points of view as possible represented in that nonprofit sector through foundations. So I'm, I'm um, a, a great advocate of nonprofits, of foundations as, a, as the source of a lot of that energy and money that makes it all happen. You're obviously very passionate about the topic um, and you care, you care uh, quite a bit about um, foundations and what they're doing and about civil society in America. But you're also critical and um, I think that your criticisms come from the heart um, and, I, and I'm wondering, um, you know, how would you, um, how would you tell us about the shortcomings of foundations? Um, I would say that, that I, can't, I, don't, I can't really explain well why foundations aren't more forthcoming about what they do. Um, I think it has to do with a lot of different things. I think it, it has to do in part because foundations would prefer not to have people second guess their decisions. Um, I think in some cases they're not sure that they've made the right decisions. I think in some cases uh, it's really a question of it's just easier for, for organizations to operate if they don't have anybody looking over their shoulders. The problem is that if people aren't looking over the shoulders of foundations, um, the, the foundations themselves cannot possibly be doing as good a job as they would otherwise do. We all benefit from criticism. We all benefit from constructive criticism as well as destructive criticism. We all benefit when people on the outside who aren't involved in what we do are looking at us. That's part of competition that, that powers the for-profit sector. Um, and there really isn't any competition that comes to bear on the, on the decision making of foundations. There really isn't any external criticism. That's, and I think it's extremely important for the, for the, in order for foundations to, to perform their mission uh, in a more effective fashion if they have that outside criticism. There's the larger issue if you, if you, uh, if you believe that the nonprofit sector ought to, be, ought to have many different ways of solving problems then you want the foundations to be open about what they're doing so that people can have blueprints of what they've done so they can replicate them. You know, the, the, the glory of the, of the natural sciences, the medical sciences, for example, is everything that everybody does with an experiment is public. Mm -hmm. And when they do an experiment, they, do, they, they, they try something, it doesn't work, everybody knows that. They don't repeat the error, uh, or they don't repeat the error in the same way. We don't have, in the social sector, with foundations, we don't have that basic information that is required for uh, the nonprofit sector to build on mistakes that people have made, to improve on models that, other, that people have made. The information just isn't there. I think I, in, in, I've mentioned from time to time, um, they, there's a wonderful guy by the name of John Abley who started a foundation. And before he started it, it's called the Argosy Foundation, he called me up and he said, we're about to start a, a large foundation and we're interested in education, we're interested in technology, we're interested in three or four other things, and I'd like to know where I can go to find out what foundations have done with what consequences. And I laughed and I said, John, there isn't any such place. Foundations don't tell you about those things. You have to dig at it in order to find it and that's not the way it should be. Let's get back to the donors, the people who set up these foundations. Um, and because I think maybe this, this secrecy or this lack of transparency, as you say in the book, might have something to do with how people approach their philanthropy. Um, you have inspiring case studies of wonderful things. Uh, and, and I would say a part of the history of the United States, which is just completely missing in a way, uh, one can find a lot in your case studies here. But donors give for lots of different reasons. And uh, you take on this question in your book. Some are instrumental, which is you know, creating change, and others are expressive. Why could that be important as we talk about foundations? It's very important because the donor leaves an imprint on, on the foundations that he or she created. Um, the foundations 
reflect the values of the donor by and large, although some critics of foundations say that they don't reflect the values enough. Uh, but they, but they by and large do reflect the values and styles of, of the donors. And many people who, with wealth, really don't want to, um, uh, they're, they're very diffident about letting people know that they've got money. They're very diffident about the spending of the money. That's why the estimate is something like 10% of all of the major individual gifts are given anonymously. Um, because people, that's, some part of it is self-protective. They don't want people to know they got money so that people won't come to them and ask them for money. But I think a lot of it has to do with a certain style of a donor, where the donor really doesn't want to brag about it. The donors, in the, and in the foundation world, everybody says, and it's true, that, well, we don't want to take credit for things that we do because we really don't do it. All we do is empower others to do it. All of our money goes to nonprofit organizations with leaders and with staff and with volunteers, and they're the ones who really do the work. We don't do the work. All we do is just provide the means for them to do the work. So it's sort of wrong for us to take credit about what they do. Mm -hmm. And I understand that. I buy that. But many initiatives of foundations today are foundation-initiated in foundation projects. Mm -hmm. In fact, if you look at the large foundations, most of them are foundation-initiated projects where they really orchestrated the idea from the beginning, picked people to, to carry the ideas mm -hmm. out, and they bear some responsibility for, their, for the judgments that they made as to whether something worked or didn't work in the people they selected, in the, the architecture of the initiative, and so on. And I think it, 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 it's very difficult for me to accept the view that, because, that, that simply because foundations exist and because the donors um, would have preferred to remain um, below the radar in these gifts, that that's appropriate for us given the advanced state of the nonprofit sector and the advanced state of philanthropy uh, as, as, as carried out by foundations today. So that leads you to some um, suggestions about foundation strategy uh, and about how foundations can be more effective based on your case studies. You have a hundred of them that you've looked at, a hundred instances of foundation programs, and um, I think these are really interesting, and then 12 are profiled in the book. Um, so talk to me a little bit about um, the strategies that you uncovered um, in, the, in the 12 cases and in the 100 cases, actually. There are many different strategies that foundations use to accomplish their objectives. Um, I talk about human resource development strategies. Um, that's one, the largest, probably, and the oldest. That is things like scholarships, fellowships, mm -hmm. where they're building human resources for the society. Um, most foundations of any age have done this forever. Um, we hear about some of the more unusual ones, such as the MacArthur Genius Awards. Uh, there, but many foundations have uh, fellowships for PhD candidates. Many foundations have scholarships for undergraduates. Many foundations, the Freeman Foundation has a very ambitious program to provide scholarships for students of of uh, East, uh, East Asian studies, uh, mm -hmm. and, they, and they claim, and I, as far as I can tell accurately, that they've educated about, their scholarships have educated some 20% of all of the, the students who studied East Asian subject matter in American colleges and universities. So human resource development is one particular strategy that, which can be carried out in a number of different ways. Um, another strategy that some foundations have used uh, is, uh, is a strategy of um, knowledge development. Um, rather, than, rather than training uh, human resources, people, it's developing new ideas about how to solve problems. Um, and I would say that's probably the second largest group of, um, of foundation programs. And there's a clear focus on st uh, strategic efforts to develop new knowledge. That's what all the medical, medical research foundations do. Uh, but it's also what a lot of the, the foundations that focus on social sector problems do. Um, there, are, I, there are strategies uh, that foundations use in building models, for example. A number of foundations mm -hmm. carry out their missions by building a model, letting it work for a few years, often not long enough, um, and then hoping that others will pick it up and then they go on to some other model building. Uh, but there are the strategy of giving prizes, for example, um, of, uh, for recognizing distinction or incenting people 
to discover whatever it is that the foundation wants to do. So the wide range of strategies that foundations use. Um, the relationship between a strategy and whether it accomplishes anything is where effectiveness comes in. Um, and a number, you know, this, to be strategic means to focus. It means to, to be clear about what you want to accomplish, to go about it in a, an orderly fashion. It really does grow, go back to what uh, Andrew Carnegie and John D. Rockefeller referred to as scientific management. Uh, it is thinking in a, in a common sense way, what is it I'm trying to accomplish? Um, what, what is the background, the context in which I'm going to try to accomplish this problem? Why is it the problem doesn't solve itself? What's keeping it from being solved? Um, what, um, what actors do I need to orchestrate in order to get it done? How am I going to know along the way whether it's working or not? Um, and how am I going to know when it's finished if it did work? That's being self-articulating, um, uh, self-conscious about the steps that need to go in to strategy. A lot of due diligence is really imp is, is essential to be effective in, in strategic initiatives and foundations. You say in the book that scientific management um, is kind of a characteristic of, of an earlier period in foundation giving, but it has fallen into disfavor. And I, I wonder if you elaborate on that. Well, it fell into disfavor during most of the middle of the 20th century, um, in the sense that just as um, I think many people in, um, in academia were suspicious of, of, uh, of value-free um, social science um, and came to see everything as a test of values rather than of scientific method. The same thing I think happened in foundations, mm -hmm. but we've returned to it. If you look at what's going on now in the field of venture philanthropy, social enterprise, um, that really is a clear return to the scientific management philosophy about, about philanthropy. It is to say that you know, we want to know, just as I laid it out a minute ago, we want to know, we want to be clear about what we're trying to do, we want to be clear about how we go about doing it, we want to be clear about knowing that we're making progress and we want to be clear about knowing that it's done when it's done. Um, and so we, we've now really moved back to that, that same approach, though it's not called scientific management, it's not very different from what Andrew Carnegie did, for example, early on. There, there's a critique, of course, of professional over-professionalization in the foundation world. How would you respond to that critique? I think that there is no, I have no clear point of view about what kinds of people make the best foundation officers, because some of the best foundation officers, both CEOs and program officers, were not specialists, and they're not scientists, and they're not management people. They're mm -hmm. people with extraordinary instinctive judgment about quality, about people with promise, about ideas, mm -hmm. a sense of timing, a sense that, that a problem is ripe to be solved, a sense that this person whom they're thinking about is the right person to lead that effort. Mm -hmm. um, but it is also true that if, you're thinking, if you think about some of the more technical areas, um, for example, in scientific research or in, um, in, res in, in efforts that require um, uh, uh, demonstration programs of one sort or another, you need people with technical expertise in order to do it. Mm -hmm. So you know, I'm, uh, I'm agnostic when it comes to any particular kind of program officer or CEO being the best person, but I do believe that every foundation that deals in certain areas has to have some specialists in there who are expert in the subject matter area as well as in the way you go about analyzing it. Is it fair to say, though, that your critique really goes to, or your recommendations really go to, the staffed foundations, the small proportion of foundations that have staff? Because as we both know, most of the foundation world is unstaffed, run yes. by volunteers. Yes. Uh, and we think that there are probably, what, 2,500, 2,000 independent foundations that have any staff, and many of those only have one, two, three staff persons. So how does a small foundation fit into your analysis? Well, the lesson from the cases is pretty clear. Uh, if you want to accomplish an objective, a defined objective, then you need to be strategic. 
And that's true whether you're a big foundation with lots of staff or a small family foundation that is unstaffed. Um, you need, I've worked, done occasionally work with individual family foundations, some of which are unstaffed, and it requires members of a family to get together and agree on what they want to give uh, and what they want to accomplish. Most of the, most of the smaller foundations really operate as sort of family charities, either by the but family, charities by the donor, and they give to many different things. Some of them have tried to get the benefits of focus uh, by narrowing their catchment areas to a particular city where they all lived or grew up or where the family fortune was made or a particular county or a particular state. And that provides a kind of focus as well. But the truth is that, that the message of the book is focus if you want to achieve something, and that applies across the board. It applies especially to the large foundations, the 2,500 or so foundations with most of the money, most of the assets and, most, and giving away most of the money, because given the fact that the taxpayers have some interest in this, because they facilitated the creation of the foundations in the first place by providing a tax deduction for gifts to establish the foundation so that that money was untaxed that went into it if it was appreciated, and they also have an interest in it because they don't, they don't pay any, foundations don't pay any taxes. So there's an, the public has an interest in seeing that, that the money in the foundations, uh, it's now, you know, the, the, the assets of foundations at this point are somewhere north of half a trillion dollars. They're spending somewhere between around 32, 32, 33 billion dollars a year. Um, the public has an interest in seeing that that money is spent to maximal social effect. That's very different from what the small, unstaffed family group foundations do, where they can afford to do what interests them. It's their money, and, and mostly, though the public has an interest in it. And if they want to spend it on the arts, or they want to spend it on, uh, on particular different approaches to one thing or another, or um, poetry, as Ruth Lilly did, or, or, or protecting cats and dogs, uh, those are all important things in a society. And if people care about them, and they made money, they ought to be able to spend them on those things. So when we talk about effectiveness and stewardship and accountability, it applies to all foundations, but the effectiveness, um, high impact, you say in the book, that really applies to the larger foundations where we expect them with that large amount of money to be using that money effectively. It does, but it also, it also applies to the community foundations, many of which are small, um, mm -hmm. the, the community foundation in, in Raleigh Durham Chapel Hill has a hundred million dollars. I mean that's large by, by by some standards, but compared to the big private foundations, it's not it's not large. Mm -hmm. And the, the community foundations have what, whatever their size, they have an obligation to be effective too because they exist for the purpose of benefiting the, the, their communities, the, the whatever their their mm -hmm. catchment area mm -hmm. happens to be. So it applies clearly to them as well as to the large private foundations, but it does apply really to, to staffed foundations because, because the, the unstaffed foundations do not have the due diligence capacity, they do not have the central point of, 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 of a CEO um, or a chief program officer through, which, through whom all of the views and values of the members of the board, mainly the donors, um, can act. They don't have a head for themselves. How about corporate foundations? You don't talk much about them in the book. I don't talk about corporate foundations in large part because that's really a separate area. Most, the corporate foundations um, really are, are, exist for, in part, for the purposes of the interests of the corporation um, and their, how much they, the corporate foundations spend typically depends on the profits the pre of the corporation the preceding year. Um, and corporations typically spend money on things that benefit um, the public perception of the corporations. Mm -hmm. There are lots of different mixed motives there that really cut against the notion of a single criterion for effectiveness in what the foundations do. Mm -hmm. uh, there, the, the large foundations, for example, give money all over, give money, give money all over the country. They give money where they've got facilities. They give. They frequently will delegate to the local, um, uh, local the officials responsible for the local units, this discretion about what they spend. Mm -hmm. A big chunk of what fa of corporate foundations give and corporations is in matching funds for them, mm -hmm. their matching employee contributions to, principally to educational institutions or to others. 
So I, I, I didn't cover them in the book because it seemed to me they were just a totally different character than the kind of philanthropic foundation. It would seem that they would have the same imperatives, though, to be effective, to, to steward their resources, and to be accountable because, after all, that is also tax-deductible money. I agree with that, that they should, but the, but the way you solve that problem struck me as being different from the way mm -hmm. the problem is solved with respect to the, the private foundations and the community foundations. Right. Um, let's talk a little bit about accountability. Um, actually, we've been talking about accountability in one form or another for, for most of our conversations. But you say that um, foundations should be held to high standards and that they should be accountable. This is part of the mission, part of the driving force because of the way that they're set up. And I wonder if there's anything more you wanted to say about accountability. It's on everybody's lips these days. Uh, foundations need to be more accountable. Do you um, see another I'll, angle to that? Well, I'll say two things about it. Um, I think that it is important for foundations to uh, take the initiative to satisfy their own accountability problems. I would hate to see um, government at any level really um, intruding itself uh, to enforce accountability more than beyond the range of accountability to the requirements of the letter of the law with respect to what, can they, what foundations can spend money on legally, um, 501c3s basically. Um, I would not, I would like not to see the, the government uh, get into the accountability arena uh, in any significant way substantively about the kinds of things that foundations do. That's where I want foundations to take the initiative themselves um, and, uh, and to adopt more openness with respect to what they do in the, along the lines that we were talking about earlier. Um, you see, I, I define accountability in the book really um, as, a, um, as an imperative to let open up the windows and the doors and let the public see what you're doing, let people in the nonprofit sector see what you're doing. Um, let's get more information out there. And there's some very good initiatives that have, that have begun by foundations um, where foundations, uh, some foundations, for example, the Wallace Foundation, the Packard Foundation, both have now uh, ad adopted the practice of hiring independent consultants at the time they make the grant. Uh, and saying, we want you to evaluate this grant from the, this initiative from the beginning to the end. We give you free license to publish whatever you want to publish. Um, and, uh, and that kind of, of self-confidence in what they're doing mm -hmm. and in letting the chips fall where they may um, mm -hmm. strikes me as very giving the public a very good reason for saying, well, that foundation is trying to do the right thing, and I think that many foundations ought to follow. And the recommendations in the book I made of getting foundations to establish some criteria of, trans of, of transparency, and then creating a group of foundations that would say to other foundations, look, we think you ought to be doing this, um, uh, whatever this happens to be, different ways of doing it, and we're going to rank foundations or give them a seal of, trans of transparency so that the public can see which ones are transparent and which ones aren't. Afterwards and several other C-SPAN programs are available for download as podcasts. More with Joel Fleischman and Elizabeth Boris in a moment. Last February, Art Buckwald checked into a Washington, D.C. hospice, expecting to live only three weeks. Over the next 11 months, he resumed his syndicated columns, wrote a book, and spent the summer on Martha's Vineyard. The Pulitzer Prize-winning humorist died Wednesday at the age of 81. Tonight on Book TV, an encore presentation of his December book talk in Washington, D.C. Art Buckwald, too soon to say goodbye, 11.15 p.m. Eastern. Afterwards with Joel Fleischman and Elizabeth Boris continues. Joel, I want to talk a little bit with you about the 12 cases that you um, selected for the book. They're inspiring. They are big deeds by foundations, the Green Revolution, uh, the Flexner Report. 
Um, why don't you tell, the, uh, tell us a little bit about why you think these cases are important and what you learned from them? I think that, the, that these cases are important because they, each of them documents a major initiative by a foundation that had um, signal benefits for society. You think about, take the Green Revolution case, which really was the Rockefeller Foundation and its 25-year pursuit of uh, the discovery of new food grains to change, um, to transform a number of developing world countries from uh, food deficit to food surplus countries. That, they stuck at it for, they stuck to it for 25 years. They hired the staff put it on the staff of the Rockefeller Foundation itself, which is, all, which is rarely done by grant-making foundations. They put them out in the field in Mexico, they, where they worked with Mexican agronomists. Uh, and lo and behold, they came up with these new food grains, mm -hmm. which ended up enabling um, not only Mexico, but Pakistan, Bangladesh, and India to go from food deficit to food surplus countries. It's been estimated by demographers that that initiative by the Rockefeller Foundation, later joined in by the Ford Foundation, um, saved anywhere between a billion and a, and a billion and a half lives. Just that's extraordinary. impact. That's extraordinary. That's impact. Yeah. Uh, or you mentioned the Flexner Report. The Flexner mm -hmm. Report uh, documents what one person supported by two foundations, uh, mm -hmm. the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching first, briefly, and then the Rockefeller Foundation, did in transforming the nature of American medicine. It was a prior to the Flexner Report, uh, Mer American medicine was proprietary. Uh, that means there were, the doctors owned um, uh, their uh, hospitals. They, 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 they were, they, they were uh, doctors who subsisted on their professional practice in teaching in medical schools. And it went from that to one in which suddenly science is brought in into medicine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And all of the only American medical school prior to the Flexner Report that had anything like that model was Johns Hopkins. And, they, and over a 30-year period, um, the Rockefeller Foundation then, which is where Flexner moved after doing the report for the Carnegie mm -hmm. Foundation with Advancement of Teaching, ended up transforming the entire American medical um, uh, uh, school practice to the point where it's now the envy of the world. How about the Soros Foundation? That's a, a more contemporary example, and it's a very different kind of impact that uh, an individual and his philanthropy has had. It was very, the, the Soros case deals with the efforts that George Soros and his foundations um, um, undertook uh, to bring about the downfall of communism uh, in uh, in Central and Eastern Europe. Very big goal. <laughs> it's a very big goal. And, you know, I mean, there were many, as is the case with all of these examples, um, one can't prove causation because there are many different forces at work. Mm -hmm. But what one can say is Soros' great idea was to target the mobilization of, uh, the, mo the creation and mobilization of civil society organizations uh, in Central and Eastern European countries, empower them with things like fax machines, um, uh, rudimentary technology that they could use to organize, to get their message out, to build support, and ultimately to bring down the Berlin Wall. Now, you know, it is, um, uh, that's an extraordinary story. It's an example of how you can, how you can take an idea and carefully implement it with the goal in mind of of achieving a certain consequence. However, George Soros himself says that he operates kind of by the seat of the pants. Um, I wonder if you see scientific management principles in what he's done. Well, scientific management enters, as I say in the book, um, mm -hmm. the, the, the judgment about what a foundation should do in terms of the initiative really almost always is a judgment that is instinctive, mm -hmm. that's informed by a good deal of knowledge, but really is basically instinctive. It's the implementation of it where the scientific management comes in. I mean, Andrew Carnegie, the, another example in the book, the Carnegie's um, um, establishment of what is now the largest or one of the largest pension funds in the world, mm -hmm. I mean, this was Carnegie's idea. It just, he said, it's a shame that college teachers 
um, have to worry about living lives of, of penury um, when they retire. Mm -hmm. And I want to do something about that. Um, and he, so he started a pension fund which required contributions from the employing institution and from the person who was, who was going to receive the pension. And he started it with a loan of $11 million. Um, mm -hmm. So it, that was his idea. It was an idea, I should tell you, that there, uh, in the book I, I, I quote um, uh, uh, John D. Rockefeller and his principal philanthropic advisor is calling it a damn fool idea mm -hmm. and saying, you know, that, the, the, Carnegie is a good example of millionaire as menace. Um, <laughs> so the truth is that, that it was an instinctive idea, but he was such a good judge of those ideas. Mm -hmm. So it's really... And now we have Tia Kraft. <laughs> and now we have TIAA Kraft, which is the, which is the insurance company, that in, the, the, the pension company, which insures virtually all college teachers, professors, foundation professionals, and many others in the nonprofit mm -hmm. sector. So that's all, it's all attributable to this extraordinary insight that mm -hmm. Andrew Carnegie had and which he resolved to, uh, to carry out. But that's the way he did things. It just he mm -hmm. was, he had these ideas, you know, it's not different, you know, his instinct and that led him to build, to, to create Carnegie Steel Corporation, which was the predecessor or one of the predecessors of U.S. Steel. Mm -hmm. It's the same kind of instinct, trying to understand how in, that, in the case of Carnegie Steel, he was going to make his fortune. He saw things about the steel industry and about how you could, how you could aggregate different components of it to build that whole enterprise. And it's the same thing in trying to figure out a major foundation initiative. Mm -hmm. Now, I've heard people say that um, one reason some of the older grants were so big and so grandiose and had such an impact is because at that point in time, of course, we had a rather small federal government and the resources at the disposal of the big foundations, you know, they sometimes dwarfed what was available uh, in the government sector. And so there was more room for foundation initiatives to have a tremendous impact. And yet, Soros is a more recent example. Uh, how, would you, how would you respond to that? Um, I think that all the, all the growth of the government means is that foundations um, work in different areas or in sometimes in cooperation with the government. Um, you think about some of the major successes of foundations have been to start things that the government ultimately picked up. For example, uh, the Carnegie Commission on Public Broadcasting. Uh, this was an example of something nobody had been able to get it going. They've been talking about it for 20 years. And the Carnegie Commission, in, from 1967 to 1968, managed to create the commission um, to 66 to 68, managed to create the commission, um, uh, get agreement on what the form should be, persuade Congress and the president to create it, uh, and suddenly we have PBS and NPR um, mm -hmm. as a consequence of this, which was initiated outside of government but picked up by, by government. And many of the initiatives of foundations end up getting picked up by government. But the truth is that government is not doing things, for example, in the area of public advocacy, uh, which is a major initiative of foundations. When we were talking about strategies earlier, I meant to say that one of the, one of the most important strategies that foundations p employ is figuring out how to change public policy, mm -hmm. um, how to change, and also uh, figuring out how to change the public's mind about things. Mm -hmm. You think about the grants that foundations, that a number of foundations made for example, to change environmental policy, starting in the, in the 60s, really building on Rachel Carson's Silent Spring, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but creating the, all of the, the public interest law centers that focused on environmental policy and which led to the people who were in those centers, supported by the Ford Foundation and other foundations, were the people who ended up writing the Clean Air Act, um, the Clean Water Act, uh, and so forth. Mm -hmm. So a lot of what foundations do are things that government isn't doing, but perhaps should do, and mm -hmm. it's the role of the foundations through the nonprofits that they end up supporting to enable the public, uh, the, the government, to pick up those things. There's no way that the government really could engage very much in the public advocacy mm -hmm. arena because mm -hmm. the whole idea of public advocacy to change public policy 
is to persuade the government to do something it's not right. doing or to do something differently from what it's doing. That could never be done by the government. Right. And yet there are some critics who feel that foundations are timid, that they're not taking on the big issues, um, big issues defined as poverty and inequality, um, and that with their resources they should be doing more in areas like those. How would you respond to that? I think that's a bum rap. Um, my mm -hmm. view is if you look at the websites of the Ford Foundation and the, and the Rockefeller Foundation, to take two examples at this point, they're both focused on helping the less well-off, both in the U.S. and abroad. It's asset building. It is, uh, it is micro, micro credit. It's a variety of kinds of things. Um, you know, the Ford Foundation and the Rockefeller Foundation are both spending in excess of 50% of their grant making abroad, and virtually all of that is going to the developing world countries. Um, so I don't, I don't, I mean, if you look at the cases in the book, for example, the mm -hmm. cases that are cited in the book or that were done for the book, many of those cases focused explicitly on benefiting the less well-off. Take LISC, for example, mm -hmm. Local Initiatives Support Corporation, um, which, is, which is, was supported for 25 years by the Ford Foundation. It was the idea of a, one, of the, one of the great American grant makers, Mike Sviridoff, um, who was the vice president for public affairs mm -hmm. of the Ford Foundation, and who saw that he, he wondered why is it that uh, financial institutions don't provide, don't give money, don't lend money mm -hmm. to poor people to build housing, to start job, to start businesses, and so forth. And he said, I think I know the reason. He said, I think the reason is that the financial institutions don't know which of the possible borrowers are credit worthy and which are not. And he said, I think that we should create an organization which will specialize in providing that credit worthiness information to financial institutions. So with an initial $25 million grant from the Ford Foundation, Sviridoff resigned his job at the foundation, became the president of the learning of the local institute initiative support corporation, leveraged over the course of this going strong, there's something like 60 to 70 little lists in that many cities around the country. Mm -hmm. And they've, they've leveraged somewhere now between four and five billion dollars in fi private financial institution money um, and, um, and government money, all of which benefits poor people. Right, which, which brings up another, another issue, and that is why do you think that foundations aren't doing more to lend their assets? I mean, I think that's one of the uh, pushes uh, recently and, of course, LISC is a great example of, of loans, but um, there are lo many billions, as you said, of assets. What, what, do you, what is your take on that? I think that the reason that fa more foundations, well, I should start by saying that, that more foundations now are doing more lending of assets than they, than they were before. Uh, but it, is, it has grown very slowly. I mean, if from the time that that uh, the Ford Foundation uh, articulated mm -hmm. a policy of program-related investments uh, back in the 70s, uh, late 60s, when Ma Mac Bundy was the president of the Ford Foundation mm -hmm. and into the 70s, um, other foundations have picked it up. I mean, the Heron Foundation in New York mm -hmm. small. is a small foundation, but does it. But, I'm, but, I, but many foundations are talking about it and many others are beginning to do it. Uh, the, the reluctance is that uh, the program-related investments, mission-related investing, is a tricky kind of thing to do. It's not as easy to do as mm -hmm. grant making mm -hmm. um, because you've got, you're dealing with the competing use of your resources if you're a foundation, your assets, is to invest it for maximum return. And that involves really figuring out how you do sophisticated asset allocation in order to increase uh, the, 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 the average return that you get, to put it in a simple, mm -hmm. in a simple mm -hmm. point. Um, it is very difficult. You have to figure that in. It complicates the mix. And the conservative um, uh, treasurer types, <coughs> um, money men who oversee foundation uh, investing of their assets, uh, are not enthusiastic about Mm -hmm. um, program-related investments, mission-related investing, because the, the returns are not as predictable as they are when you've got discrete asset classes. And so it, it just complicates it. 
Is the movement he making headway? Yes, it is. Should it make headway? Yes, it should. But it's been a very slow growth process. The, this uh, reminds me of, an, of another issue, and that is when foundations invest in staff and effectiveness and planning and evaluation, all great things that I think we both agree really should be done, it raises the cost of operating the foundation. And uh, I want to talk about some of your suggestions. But it seems to me that Congress has been looking at um, the administrative costs of foundations, the executive salaries. Um, is this a counterforce to the very call for effectiveness and accountability that you've uh, heralded? I don't think it is. I think that the, that the congressional ire and public concern um, have focused really on salaries, particularly of the higher officers of the foundations, perks, um, uh, first class travel, and things of that nature. I haven't heard of any criticism about the fact that the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation spends approximately 50%, 15 per 15 percent, excuse me, 15 percent of its grant making budget on evaluation. Um, and many other foundations spend significant amounts of their percentages of their grant making on evaluation, which is a form of trying to ascertain and increase the likelihood of effectiveness. So I don't, th I think that while it is true that, that you, the more you spend on things like transparency and evaluation uh, and communication with the public, you do raise your overhead costs. The fact is, that I don't think the public objects to that. It's not, it's the person, it's the seemingly personal benefit that occurs by the, um, uh, among the, uh, the leaders of the foundations uh, that is what worries uh, the public. Um, and, you know, there's some foundations, because of the way they operate, uh, they have higher administrative costs. Foundations mm -hmm. that run conference centers, for example. Right. Um, now, if the sophisticated foundations have come to understand how you can, how you accurately ac allocate their costs across a lot of their program initiatives, but some of others haven't, and that also complicates mm -hmm. the problem of of, of uh, it makes it appear that they're really spending more money on administrative costs than they really are. Absolutely. Um, I want to get to your recommendations and your suggestions. Uh, you make some rather radical proposals. I think some people would call them radical uh, to enhance transparency. Um, you talk about the lack of government oversight, the need for self-regulation, and failing that, the need for a greater government regulation. Uh, tell me about the proposal for um, more government oversight. The problem with government oversight at this point is that it is, ex that it is almost non-existent. Um, the IRS has been tasked with, uh, as far as the federal government is concerned, um, overseeing the nonprofit sector. That means seeing that they behave according to the law. Um, it means catching people who are using the nonprofit form for personal advantage, fraud, things of that nature. Mm -hmm. um, Nobody thinks that the IRS has the human resource power at this point um, to, uh, f to do that job effectively. Um, and I suspect, though many people disagree with me, I suspect that the reason is that, that whatever the IRS does in the exempt organization arena is tiny compa in comparison mm -hmm. with, what it, what, with, the, with what it does in overseeing uh, uh, individual and corporate taxes. In terms of the revenues, it's just minuscule uh, in, the not, in the exempt organization arena. Um, you know, when they first passed the, the foundation tax in 1969, the, um, um, the purpose of, that, of, of, the, of the revenues generated by that tax was for oversight of the nonprofit sector. Um, it is ne that, that tax is generates, depending on the year, it generates something between 300 and 600 or 700 million dollars a year. The budget from the exempt, of the ex exempt organization division of the IRS um, is about 50 million dollars. All of the rest of that money coming from the foundation tax, which was intended by Congress to be used in overseeing the nonprofit sector, is going into the general treasury. Um, now, I have no objection to money going into the general treasury, mm -hmm. but I do have a very strong objection to the, to the fact that the nonprofit sector doesn't have adequate government oversight. So I suggested picking up on 
a proposal by Mark Owen, who was himself the director of the exempt organization division of the IRS, that a new form of organization be created that's related to the IRS, but independent of it, a, 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 a public corporation that would, and it would be a nonprofit um, set up by Congress and empowered with certain powers to enable it to fulfill its function. It would leave certain responsibilities, such as the granting of 501c3 status with the IRS, but it would delegate to this new organization that would be modeled on the National Association of Securities Dealers um, the, um, uh, the actual implementation of it to be sure that there were ways in which adequate oversight could be, um, could be given. You would have a separate entity that would not have to be involved with the budget mm -hmm. uh, negotiations for the IRS. Seems to make a lot of sense to me. What do you think the obstacles are? I think the obstacles, are, there are many people who think that the IRS should not, um, uh, not, it should, should, it should not be taken away from the IRS. Um, and of course, the, the Hill committees with jurisdiction over government agencies would, would prove to be an obstacle too. But I am firmly convinced that until we have some other entity which, which is designated and funded mm. uh, with sufficient resources, uh, to oversee the nonprofit sector, we're not going to be able to to ensure minimal compliance with the um, with the laws uh, that are on the books, and that's really where I, I the, the the primary function, as far as I'm concerned, of government oversight is in being sure that the laws are obeyed, that that criminals are not using the nonprofit form to benefit themselves mm -hmm. or to defraud the public. That's what, I, that's what I want to see government oversight do. Uh, I want to, with respect to self-regulation, which was the next point that you raised, um, I want to see foundations take, go beyond the scope of what is minimally required by the law and adopt a higher set of standards for ourselves um, in, uh, in, in, so that we can, we can aspirationally uh, 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 try to do better than yes. the minimum. You mentioned a transparency and accountability code. Could right. you, uh, what would that do for us? Well, it would, it, would, um, it would serve the purpose of ensuring that, um, that the public would know what foundations are doing, that people who wanted to learn from what foundations are doing could learn from foundation what they do because the knowledge would be available. The blueprints about things that foundations do would be available generally. They're not, after all, uh, intellectual property that foundations have uh, any right to keep a monopoly on. And further, it would, the, the existence mm -hmm. of open communication by people on the outside of what foundations are doing and the opportunity for criticism would make a tremendous difference. When you think about all of the forces that, that are arrayed to provide that per external perspective on for-profits, on corporations, mm -hmm. Everything from the Wall Street analysts to the business reporters to the competitors who are always looking to acquire a company uh, to the shareholders who can vote management in and out, though they don't do it very often. Um, all of those things, we have nothing like that in the nonprofit sector mm -hmm. as a whole, although nonprofit organ operating nonprofits have some uh, built in um, uh, sh uh, accountability enforcing agents, such as. Uh, students at universities, faculty, alumni at universities, patients in hospitals, doctors in hospitals, but foundations have none. And it is really important, it seems to me, that we build in those external, uh, build into the, into the way in which foundations are governed, um, the, those external perspectives on what they do. We, we both know that foundations are very independent. They really value their independence and that it's very hard to get them to agree on um, something like a code of transparency and accountability. I was at the Council on Foundations when they tried to instill principles and practices. Now, it did pass, but it was multi-year-long conversation, and some foundations ultimately left the Council on Foundations. What makes you think that foundations could come around, or do you think foundations could come around to a code of transparency that would really have some teeth and that would be accepted by the field? I think that foundations can come around, and I think that they will come around, in part because the idea of public, public and public-related institutions being transparent 
was a very new thing when the council went through that exercise. Uh, mm -hmm. It now is not a new thing. It is taken for granted. We have a Freedom of Information Act in federal government. Many states have Freedom of Information Acts. The notion is that, that public business is public business, and it ought to be open. At least certain kinds of information ought to be open to the mm -hmm. public. So I think that there is a momentum to the idea of transparency, which I believe is beginning to move foundations. That's precisely why I think the Wallace Foundation and the, um, and the Packard Foundation have decided to put, bring in independent consultants and free them to publish whatever they want to publish. It's why the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation is now putting up its assessments, or at least some of its assessments, uh, on their website. I think that's going to grow, and the, web, the existence of websites is making a tremendous difference as well. Oh, I think so, too. Um, I'd like to ask you a little bit about this Foundation Freedom of Information Act. You say, failing all else, maybe we need to have greater government regulation. And I know you carefully qualify it, but I'd like people to understand, what would a Foundation Freedom of Information Act do? It would guarantee to um, whom, whoever ended up being having the right to bring a suit or, or articulate a request, some kinds of information, the information that foundations generate. Uh, it might, for example, uh, uh, enable persons to get copies of assessments. Um, there was a very plaintive letter, for example, in the in Education Week, week last fall, oh, in, the, in the summertime, uh, from the head of the Education Leadership Program at Brooklyn College, in which he talked about the fact that when, when, when um, that college works with public school systems uh, in various projects that they run uh, in trying to reform education, uh, that they can get the information generated, the evaluative info the evaluations generated under those programs um, because they're government documents. But when a foundation, and the, he, he mentioned particularly the Gates Foundation, when the Gates Foundation supported an initiative in which they were involved, the Gates Foundation basically had proprietary control over the, uh, over the evaluative documents, and they couldn't get control of them. And mm -hmm. so the point is, you know, particularly where foundations are working with public institutions, there is some rationale for having individuals on the outside of the foundation have access to those. And I want to underscore what I said earlier. I am not proposing at this point a Freedom of Information Act for foundations. I don't want government to get involved as long as I think there is the possibility that foundations can take the initiative themselves in, making, in becoming more transparent and in providing that information. I hope that they will do that, and I only offered the idea of the Freedom of, the freedom of Information Act as sort of a last-ditch effort if they don't. I think that's a great place to, to end our conversation, and I want to thank you very, very much for this conversation, this opportunity to speak with you about your book. I think it really is an important book, and I hope my goal would be for lots of people to read it and discuss it. Publicly acknowledge failures by foundations. Now, that's just unbelievable. What that means is that not only are foundations not talking about their failures, but why should people believe what they say about their successes? Uh, if they don't talk about their failures. Because people are going to say, well, if they don't talk about their failures, there must be some things wrong there, and some of these things they're claiming as successes really weren't successes. Now, do you think people understand, Joel, you know, what is a foundation? Maybe we ought to start there. Uh, why, why are they important in the American polyarchy, a ter term that you use? They're very important because they empower individuals with widely varying points of view to express their values in ways that affect the larger sphere. So that you've got lots of different ways of solving the problem of public, problems of public education if you've got many different people working in there. And what I say in the book is that, that you've, given the fact that America has um, uh, a nonprofit sector, which is, most people would say who think about this thing, the envy of the world. Mm -hmm. We've got, at this point, um, uh, according to the most recent count, more than a million uh, 501c3 charitable nonprofits. That doesn't include most of the churches and religious organizations, which probably is another 300 to 350,000 entities. So you're up to 1.3 million charitable organizations plus the non-charitable not-for-profit organizations 
that is the 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 PACs and a variety of other uh, mutual benefit organizations. Mm -hmm. So you you got a nonprofit sector with 1.9 million organizations spending, according to the IRS's most recent figures, somewhere in excess of a trillion dollars. It's probably close to a 1.5 trillion dollars, 1.4 trillion dollars. You put mm -hmm. that against the federal the federal budget, for example, which you've got a federal budget uh, this year of 2.8 trillion dollars in a national economy of 14 trillion dollars you think about that's a very significant proportion of what the federal government is spending so it's important that the public understand that the that the nonprofit sector is important the nonprofit sector the venture capital that enables the nonprofit sector to be creative original pioneering in its solutions is in large part the work of foundations the foundations really are the kernel of that social venture capital that powers the nonprofit sector. And I think it's extremely important that, um, that we have as many different points of view as possible represented in that nonprofit for uh, the nonprofit sector to build on mistakes that people have made, to improve on models that, other, that people have made. The information just isn't there. I think I, and, and I've mentioned from time to time um, they, there's a wonderful guy by the name of John Abley who started a foundation and before he started it, it's called the Argosy Foundation, he called me up and he said, we're about to start a, a large foundation and we're interested in education, we're interested in technology, we're interested in three or four other things and I'd like to know where I can go to find out what foundations have done with what consequences. And I laughed and I said, John, there isn't any such place. Foundations don't tell you about those things. You have to dig at it in order to find it, and that's not the way it should be. Let's get back to the donors, the people who set up these foundations. Um, and because I think maybe this, this secrecy or this lack of transparency, as you say in the book, might have something to do with how people approach their philanthropy. Um, you have inspiring case studies of wonderful things. Uh, and, and I would say, a part of the history of the United States, which is just completely missing in a way. Uh, one can find a lot in your case studies here. But donors give for lots of different reasons. And uh, you take on this question in your book. Some are instrumental, which is you know, creating change, and others are expressive. Why could that be important as we talk about foundations? It's very important because the donor leaves an imprint on, on the foundations that he or she created. Um, and the foundations reflect the values of the donor by and large, although some critics of foundations say that they don't reflect the values enough, uh, but, they, but they by and large do reflect the values and styles of, of the donors. And many people who, with wealth, really don't want to, um, uh, they're, they're very diffident about letting people know that they've got money. They're very diffident about the spending of the money. That's why the estimate is something like 10% of all of the major individual gifts are given anonymously. Um, because people, that's, some part of it is self-protective. They don't want people to know they got money so that people won't come to them and ask them for money. But I think a lot of it has to do with a certain style of a donor, where the donor really doesn't want to brag about it. The donors, in the, and in the foundation world, everybody says, and it's true, that, well, we don't want to take credit for things that we do because we really don't do it. All we do is empower others to do it. All of our money goes to nonprofit organizations with leaders and with staff and with volunteers, and they're the ones who really do the work. We don't do the work. All we do is just provide the means for them to do the work. So it's sort of wrong for us to take credit about what they do. And I understand that. I buy that. But many initiatives of foundations today are foundation-initiated foundation projects. Mm -hmm. In fact, if you look at the large foundations, most of them are foundation-initiated projects where they really orchestrated the idea from the beginning, picked people to, to carry the ideas mm -hmm. out, and they bear some responsibility for, their, for the judgments that they made as to whether something worked or didn't work in the people they selected, in the, the architecture of the initiative, and so on. And I think it, 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 it's very difficult for me to accept the view that, beca that, that simply because foundations exist and because the donors um, would have preferred to remain um, below the radar in these gifts, that that's appropriate for us given the advanced state of the nonprofit sector and the advanced state of 
philanthropy uh, as, as, as carried out by foundations today. So that leads you to some um, suggestions about foundation strategy uh, and about how foundations can be more effective based on your case studies. You have a hundred of them that you've looked at, a hundred instances of foundation programs, and um, I think these are really interesting, and then 12 are profiled in the book. Um, so talk to me a little bit about um, the strategies that you uncovered um, in, the, in the 12 cases and in the 100 cases, actually. There are many different strategies that foundations use to accomplish their objectives. Um, I talk about human resource development strategies. Um, that's one, the largest, probably, and the oldest. That is things like scholarships, fellowships, mm -hmm. where they're building human resources for the society. Um, most foundations of any age have done this forever. Um, you, we hear about some of the more unusual ones, such as the MacArthur Genius Awards, uh, there, but many foundations have uh, fellowships for PhD candidates. Many foundations have scholarships for undergraduates. Many foundations, the Freeman Foundation has a very ambitious program to provide scholarships for students of, of uh, East, uh, East Asian studies. Uh, mm -hmm. and, they, and they claim, and I, as far as I can tell accurately, that they've educated about their scholarships, have educated some 20% of all of the, the students who've studied East Asian subject matter in American colleges and universities. So human resource development is one particular strategy that, which can be carried out in a number of different ways. Um, another strategy that some foundations have used uh, is, uh, is a strategy of... Joel, it's such a great pleasure to be speaking with you today about your new book, um, The Foundation, A Great American Secret, How Private Wealth is Changing the World. Great title, by the way, and I think it's, it's quite true. Uh, we're at a pivotal turning point, it seems to me, in the history of foundations. Foundations are much more visible, I think, than they have been in the past. We have uh, constant news stories about the Gates Foundation and the things that they're doing in Africa. We have the Warren Buffett's magnificent gift to the Gates Foundation, $31 billion. And yet, despite all that publicity, your book says, and I think it's true, that this foundations are a great American secret. And that secret, it seems to me, is double-edged. Um, the public doesn't know about foundations, and foundations are quite secretive. Tell us about this great American secret. The reason I wrote the book uh, is that uh, I believe the public deserves to know what foundations do and that foundations deserve to have the public know what they do. Um, given the fact that foundations are messing around in every, lots of things dealing with the public, public supported programs, um, public education, welfare, the environment, uh, health, all of those things, uh, the public has a right to know what foundations are doing. Um, but more than that, uh, if the public doesn't know exactly what foundations are doing. Those people who want to start programs of their own really don't have any basis on which to make a judgment about what works, what doesn't work, how it works, why it doesn't work. Um, and that really is the nature of the secret. The, the secret, I, I call it a secret for two reasons. One, because foundations really don't tell very much about what they're doing. And secondly, uh, because of the fact that um, the public doesn't know anything about foundations. The surveys show that if you ask the public um, what, what a foundation is, uh, the most recent survey I showed, uh, I saw, uh, uh, revealed that only 12% of the public knew what a foundation, could name a foundation. That's just naming a foundation. That doesn't have anything to do with naming what the foundation does. And so, so what should the public know, Joe? I think the public really should know when, about foundation failures, for example. Um, it's, you know, it's inconceivable, impossible, that, if, that with the 30-some billion dollars that a foundation sp spends every year, that the, all the foundations spend every year, that mm -hmm. uh, they, don't make any, they don't have any failures. And yet, for the, when I wrote the book, I could document only four or five um, profit sector through foundations. So I'm, uh, I'm um, a, a great advocate of nonprofits, of foundations as, a, as the source of a lot of that energy and money that makes it all happen. You're obviously very passionate about the topic um, and you care, you care uh, quite a bit about um, foundations and what they're doing 
and about civil society in America. But you're also critical. And um, I think that your criticisms come from the heart. Um, and, I, and I'm wondering, um, you know, how would you, um, how would you tell us about the shortcomings of foundations? Um, I would say that, that I, can't, I, don't, I can't really explain well why foundations aren't more forthcoming about what they do. Um, I think it has to do with a lot of different things. I think it, it has to do in part because foundations would prefer not to have people second guess their decisions. Um, I think in some cases they're not sure that they've made the right decisions. I think in some cases uh, it's really a question of it's just easier for, fa for organizations to operate if they don't have anybody looking over their shoulders. The problem is that if people aren't looking over the shoulders of foundations, um, the, the foundations themselves cannot possibly be doing as good a job as they would otherwise do. We all benefit from criticism. We all benefit from constructive criticism as well as destructive criticism. We all benefit when people on the outside who aren't involved in what we do are looking at us. That's part of competition that, that powers the for-profit sector. Um, and there really isn't any competition that comes to bear on the, on the decision making of foundations. There really isn't any external criticism. That's, and I think it's extremely important for the, for the, in order for foundations to, to perform their mission uh, in a more effective fashion if they have that outside criticism. There's the larger issue if you, if, if you, uh, if you believe that the nonprofit sector ought to, be, ought to have many different ways of solving problems then you want the foundations to be open about what they're doing so that people can have blueprints of what they've done so they can replicate them. You know, the, the, the glory of the, of the natural sciences, the medical sciences, for example, is everything that everybody does with an experiment is public. Mm -hmm. And when they do an experiment, they, do, they, they, they try something, it doesn't work, everybody knows that. They don't repeat the error, uh, or they don't repeat the error in the same way. We don't have in the social sector with foundations, we don't have that basic information that is required 